right, and buenos dias, mis amigos. Uh, today we're going to look at uh, a preterist, okay? So what I like to do is I like to keep an eye on people that talk about Revelation 20, people that talk about millennial reign, that sort of stuff. And it's amazing, it really is, that every single one of these people that are putting out videos, they all got it wrong. Alright, it's absolutely incredible. And I can prove it to you by showing you what the Bible says. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I can come across, there's one down here by a preterist. And we're just going to examine what he has to say. Alright. I'm To me, this is a clear indication that we are in the end times toward the end of the world and the reason why I say that is we know that we're really close to the end when everybody teaches falsely you think about Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 when Jesus is asked what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and the very first thing Jesus says is take heed that no man deceives you all right so let's listen to what uh, this youtuber Sean McMahon has to say this and following uh, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so we can continue this conversation and all that stuff but I again I appreciate you listening in and I hope you find it helpful, and I'm always, always happy to hear everyone else's comments and input. So once again, thanks, Pastor Bob. Appreciate you. Uh, and here's what Pastor Bob had to say. Uh, he responded to my full Preterist Eschatology 101 video uh, with the following comment. He said, I'm taking my first real look at the topic. I have two questions you did not cover. Question one is Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And Revelation 21, verse 10 through Revelation 22, chapter, uh, verse 5, excuse me. He says, obviously these have not happened. I'm truly interested in the topic. Can you please explain? Thank you in advance. Sure, I'm going to take a stab at that question. Um, I'm going to break this up into one or two parts just in the interest of time, but I wanted to get cracking for you while it was still relevant, while you're still interested. So sure, let's talk about these passages. Um, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, that's the vision of the great white throne judgment. And chapter 21, 10 uh, through chapter 22, 5, that's the descent of the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So let's tackle the great white throne judgment first. And it reads, Then I saw a great white throne and the one seated on it. So the first question is, All right, there, what's there's a red flag. <laughs> that's a red, red flag. All right, so let's go this direction here and I'll show you what I mean by that. All right, so let's go check out what other Bible versions, the corrupt Bible versions, say about this. And, and just let me go back here. I'm, I don't want anybody to be mistaken about this, for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now let's go check this out real quick. Right here, we see, well, let's go to ESV. We, we are not like so many peddlers of the Word of God. So, ESV changes corrupt to peddlers as though we're not as many that sell the Word of God. And uh, NSAB, the NIV, well, what else you got here? I mean, all of these are corrupt. They changed what the Scripture says, and then they use the word peddle which means to sell and even NIV says unlike so many we do not peddle the Word of God for profit yet 
they do peddle their Bible version for profit. They make a lot of money. And the reason they change what the scripture says is so that they can be legal, so they can abide by copyright laws, so they can sell their Bible versions, so they can make some money, lots of money. I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable, but nobody cares. Most people don't even care. They just trust what Reverend Bobby says, and they don't they don't care what the Bible says. And so this is the world that we're living in right now. And this video here is an, is just another example of that. So uh, here in Revelation 20 verse 11, we see seated, 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 and that's not what it says. But they have to change it just enough. So they can abide by the copyright laws, so they can peddle their Bible for profit. All right, ESV says seated. The let's see, let's go down, down, down. And the NIV says seated. But the Bible, the Word of God, the true, perfect, pure Word of God says, and him that sat on it. Right, you see what's going on here? I hope so, because this is a big deal. Notice this, right? There isn't a white throne anywhere else that you see in uh, in Revelation and Scripture. So, what other clues are there, right? The other clue is the one seated on it, right? This is the judgment scene. So, the one seated on it is the judge. This is this is Christ. This is God. Uh, I just want to check something. I, you know, I don't know, but let's just see what happens here. Yeah, the only place where it says white throne. I don't know how this thing works here. If I do that, will that just? No, that won't even do it. Okay. All right, never mind. God in Christ. So the white throne is Christ's throne. Okay. He's got. So he's got that right. There's no mistake about that. As I understand it, folks who believe that the White Throne Judgment is yet to come, they believe that this scene takes place on Earth in the future after Christ's return to Earth. Uh, you know, he's probably right. <clears throat> he, there probably are people teaching that, but that's not what the Bible says. And maybe I guess before I continue, I better make this clear. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Alright? Now this parallels many other places in the Bible, but I'm just going to use one. I mean, I could use Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 and just there's a lot more I could use but one should be enough when the sun is darkened and the moon should not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken this is the exact same moment when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven just like what we read in Revelation chapter 1 behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. All right. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and heaven fled away. The sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. And stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. There should be no mistaking about it. it all you have to do is connect the dots. Right, if you're not gonna, if you're not able to connect this dot here, that dot with this, you can't. How do, can you understand anything, man? Really, how can you understand anything that's written in the Bible if you can't make that simple connection? Seriously. Well, people willingly do not 
want to make that connection because then that blows away this idea of the Hollywood movie left behind completely destroys it All right and people would rather believe in a Hollywood movie than believe in the Bible that they hold in their hands and I'm being serious about that birth right yet when we search scripture for the location of Christ's throne right at the beginning of Revelation chapter 4 John tells us he says behold a throne set in heaven you know he's right but he's I gotta check it out because uh, this guy clearly does not believe in the Bible that he holds in his hands there's no way anybody can have an ESV and an NIV and believe that is the true pure word of God unless you're a new you know young fella right new believer and you just don't know any better all right immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne all right okay all right so this is what he's referring to and uh, of course uh, you know you think about who's sitting on the throne well it's Jesus it's always Jesus and one sat on the throne so he sees a throne in heaven okay he's taken in the spirit to heaven so this throne is actually in heaven that would seem to indicate that the white throne judgment takes place in heaven right but it's it's actually not that black and white <laughs> uh, yeah it is that black and white it's clear as day it's supported all throughout the scripture it's repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again all throughout the Bible when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet now, this is crystal clear all throughout the Bible and what's curious about the white throne judgment is this detail in chapter 20 verse 11 where it says heaven and earth fled from his presence well what is John trying to say here is he saying the judgment takes place in some dimension separate from both earth and heaven it's tempting to want to superimpose our own free flow what some dimension what what are you you watch too many Hollywood movies man I'm telling you you're trying to fix your Hollywood movie you're trying to put your Hollywood movie doctrine into the Bible and it's not gonna work Exploding understanding of heaven and earth onto this first right our 21st century dimension like the fourth and fifth dimension man this is make-believe stuff you do realize that no come on understanding what that is but we should instead ask ourselves since prophecy is a pattern of heavenly things is there a pattern in which fit these words earth and heaven fled from his presence do we find this anywhere else in scripture and do we find this anywhere else in scripture it's all throughout scripture and the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken have you never read that before? Seriously. To even ask that question is juvenile, is it not? I mean, it's like, have you ever read the Bible? And here you are talking and pretending to teach the Bible. And you have no idea what the Bible says. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. It's the same thing in Mark 13. In Luke 21, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon earth, the distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. All right, so it's the same thing, man. If you can't connect 
Revelation 21 with Matthew 24 and Mark 13, then you're not going to be able to make a connection with Revelation 20 verse 11, but it's obvious. This is the same event. There is no two comings of the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. Come on. It's the same thing, man. Now, if you want to, uh, you know, preach this amazingly, incredibly, unbelievable doctrine of, you know, dispensationalism and Hollywoodism, and then you're going to start dividing these things, right? But that that's because you lack faith, and because you lack faith, you lack understanding of the simple scripture that is laid out for us all throughout the Bible. It's incredible, man. It really is. How could you look at this and think it's a different event? It's astonishing, huh? The prophetic patterns. That's the question. So that sounds familiar, right? We should be reminded of the heavens rolling up like a scroll, the destruction of the heavens and earth. These are themes throughout prophecy, scattered throughout scripture. Luckily for us, we don't need to be left to our own devices for the interpretation of these prophecies scattered throughout scripture. In fact, St. Peter does it for us. He does this for us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he explains that the world before the... Alright, 2 Peter 3... You know, this, <laughs> I don't know what he's trying to say here, but let's, uh, let's just go over this real quickly, because I don't trust nothing he says, obviously. Uh, whenever he quotes the Bible, he's quoting a corrupt Bible, so I want to know exactly what the true word of God says, knowing this first, that there should come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are, are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in the holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Okay. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Alright, now let's go back. Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This has nothing at all to do with Bible prophecy. Nothing. Not a single time can you use this to reference a Bible prophecy anywhere in the Bible, ever. Not even a single time. This is not about you. This is about the Lord. And the context of this conversation is that God is not slack concerning his promise. Has nothing at all to do with, well, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years, and we're utterly confused, and so we're going to take this and apply this to Bible prophecy and utterly confuse you. It's not confusing. This, apply, this is about God 
saying, hey, God sees it all from the beginning to the end. He can see it in a moment of time, and he can take a moment of time and see it as though it's a thousand years, a long, long time. He can magnify he can put a magnifying glass on a moment of time and examine it all, and he can see it all in a moment of time. That's all this is talking about. And so the context is God is not slack concerning his promise. You know, to us it might seem like you're taking a long time, God. But no, everything is um, playing out just the way it's supposed to be. All right. And we got nothing to worry about. I mean, unless you're not born of the Spirit of God, we got nothing to worry about. So whether jesus comes today or he comes in a thousand years from now it does not matter because we have everlasting life we're going to live forever no matter what happens all right so there's nothing to worry about unless you're not saved okay but the flood was a heavens and an earth right but he says that that former heavens and earth, that's no more. It was destroyed by water. And he says in the same way, the heavens and earth of his time would be destroyed by fire. Now remember, he wasn't writing to us. Yeah, that wrong, 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 wrong. I mean, that this is a blatant, outright lie. If what Peter is writing is, does not, is not to us, then nothing in the Bible is for us. If you're going to dismiss Peter, I mean, that's kind of like what the Muslims do when they say Paul was a liar. So you can't believe nothing Paul says. And, I mean, it's incredible. This sort of teaching, to me, has got this, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, Jewish undertones to it. Because the Jewish people will say, well, you can't, you can't, that's not applied to you. Right? I mean, like you're not one of God's people, so that doesn't apply to you. That only applies to somebody else. I mean, you've heard you've heard that before, right? Now, those people are insane. Now, they're liars, and they're, that can only come from the devil to say, "Well, this Bible is not for you." And I always like to point to. Uh, you know, I could go to uh, my Facebook page, but I got this verse uh, as my uh, my main picture or whatever. Oh, I can't remember what the verse says, though. It's the very last verse in the book, or right now, Mark 13. All right, so we'll go down here. And, you know, Mark 13... You remember what I read a little bit ago? Except those days be shortened, no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The very last verse. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. What Jesus is saying to them, he is saying to all, watch. All right, watch. This is going to play out exactly how Jesus has promised. Now, you think about, uh, well, you know, Peter isn't Jesus, and all this and that, and, and uh, where am I at here? And, but I'm telling you, this, this, here, oops, here we go. Uh, all, all this, every single word that you read in the Bible, you, you can't credit Paul. You can't credit Peter. You can't credit... You know, David or John or whoever. No. First of all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. All right. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So where does the scripture come from? It comes from God. It doesn't come from man. If you're believing it comes from man, you're not trusting God. 
you believe God can resurrect you from the dead but God can't give you his word in your language well, what kind of God is that I don't think you believe in God at all if that's what you believe now, I'm serious about that if you believe that what Peter wrote is not for you then you're a liar you're of the devil and you have no understanding whatsoever none whatsoever and here you are pretending to know something you don't know Jack but to his disciples in the first century church okay he says the present heavens and earth okay he's referring to his present time and he's referring to that while writing to his disciples in the church his letter was a matter of urgency okay he rebukes the scoffers who say that the lord's coming is delayed because christ did say this generation will not pass away until all is this generation is not uh, oh you know what 40 years however you want to put it when jesus says in matthew 25 if i remember right let's find out i don't want to get this wrong oops no no it's, it's matthew 24 duh duh duh, duh. all right so Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Uh, so, in the context, uh, learn the parable of the fig tree when the branches get tender and puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away now what's this generation is it 20 years is it 40 years or is it the generation of the kingdom of God being available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and it has to be the latter it has to be there's no way around it so when it says here the generation this is equivalent to the thousand years it's a term used to describe a period of time this generation would it have helped you uh, if <laughs> I mean this would it have helped you if Jesus instead said uh, this dispensation I mean really well this dispensation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled no the proper word is generation I believe that wholeheartedly but it's misunderstood by people that lack faith in the Word of God all right so this generation can only be talking about the generation from the time of Jesus on earth to the time of his return. That's the only possibility. It's not possible to say this is 20 years or 40 years. Okay, whatever you want to say. 40 years, uh, 70 years, whatever. Imagine that that was the case. then everything that was written down would have been written down in vain and everything that was written down would have been burned up and would not be visible today all right it's just so mind-bogglingly ignorant to suggest that this was you know only for those guys right because we clearly know this has not happened not even close
all is fulfilled in reference to the last days prophecies, okay? Peter is referencing John's revelation in this chapter. Is He's he? indicating. Peter's referencing John? Or Peter is just openly speaking the truth that is supported by scripture all throughout the Bible. How I don't think he's referencing John at all. I mean, well, why doesn't he say John said this? All right. <laughs> Let's do something here real quick. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures? I mean, he's he's referencing scripture, all right? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith. And Peter doesn't do that at all. So you're just making this up. That he was writing in the midst of the thousand years, by the way, the thousand years reign mentioned in Rev uh, Revelation 20, when he says, Beloved, do not let this one thing escape your notice. I already talked about this. I already talked about it, man. This has absolutely nothing to do. So, the thousand years wasn't a thousand years. It was, according to him, it was one day. All right, well, why not take one day out of a thousand years and then narrow that down even more to a moment in time? The thousand years was, had come and gone before... Um, you know, John even was able to get that sentence out of his mouth. <laughs> and you talk about being willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. This is anybody that uses Second Peter chapter three verse eight as applicable to Bible prophecy they are willingly ignorant they're purposely being stupid because this has absolutely nothing at all to do with Bible scripture whatsoever this is all about the way it is for God I already explained this right it's all about to God he can see the beginning from the end he can see a moment in time and stretch it out as though it was a long period of time he can use a magnifying glass and look at each and every moment of time and he can see everything as from the beginning to the end as though it was just a moment of time this has absolutely nothing at all to do with interpreting Bible scripture. Nothing whatsoever. And you're just blatantly lying when you use this as some sort of tool to interpret Bible prophecy. All right, you're deliberately lying when you do that. Notice with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, but he's patient with you. With you, not us, but Peter's first century disciples. He's patient with you, Peter said. Okay, so God's not patient with you. God's patient with first century disciples of Peter. You know how stupid that sounds? God's not patient with you. God don't care about you. He only cared about those people and that was a long time ago and he don't give a crap about you. To hell with you and to hell with me and to hell with everybody. He only cared about Peter's disciples thousands of years ago. He's saying you, my disciples. He's patient with you and not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. Yeah, that's not, that's not, he don't care about that anymore. This was a long time ago. See, to hell with everybody else. See, all right. At one time, God was not willing that any should perish, but now he don't give a crap. He don't give a S-H, you know what. You know, hey, if you come to repentance or you, or you don't, who cares? At one time, God cared, but he don't care now. You see how stupid this is? 
And this is just as evil and wicked as anything you will hear this day. In other words, Peter is saying, the Lord isn't delayed because we're in the midst of a literal thousand years. Don't believe the scoffers who say he's not coming anytime soon. He is coming. He's coming soon. And what would happen when he comes? It says, the heavens will disappear like a roar or what? flee away, right? That's what John says. And he goes on, he says, the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and its works will be laid bare. Now that brings us back to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. The earth and the heavens fled away, right? Similar language. It's a parallel to this destruction which Peter has described, which itself, this is a recapitulation of the Old Testament prophecies of the last days. This is all Old Testament prophecy. But thanks to Peter, we understand that just as the flood did not destroy the heavens and earth forever, but led to a new heavens and earth, right? So also the destruction which Peter warned was imminent would not blot out all creation forever, but lead to, as he concludes in verse 13, God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Okay, now, therefore it's appropriate that John's vision of the white throne judgment, which Peter is following in 2 Peter 3, right? That's immediately followed by a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. That's Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Okay, now before we proceed to the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21, I want to regroup. Yeah, yeah, but you need to regroup, because where the hell are you going with this? Really. You now have put yourself in a position to say that Right now, we are in a new heaven and a new earth. All right, right now, Jesus Christ has already returned, and that the elect have already been resurrected, and we are now living on a new earth with a new heaven wherein dwells righteousness. All right, and of course, if you've read uh, for example 1 Corinthians 15 you would know that we are now according to you in our glorified bodies right in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump this has already happened according to him for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So according to him, according to Sean McMahon, this has already happened. We've already been transformed into our glorified body. And we shall never die. And there should, and actually, if you go to Revelation, see he's going to have to wiggle his way out of this. So after Jesus comes, there is no more death. Oh, I didn't want to do this. Uh, but here, okay. There shall be no more death. All right. So after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and um, we are changed, transformed into our glorified bodies. And once, once this happens, man, he once he puts all enemies under his feet, just like it says in Revelation 20, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. At the last trump, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There is no more death after this. After, you know, um, like it says in Genesis 3, verse 15, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Psalm 110, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Revelation 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. And Revelation 20, verse 9, And fire comes down from God out of heaven, and devours them all. After this, then will be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There's no more death after this. So now uh, Mr. McMahon has put himself in a very difficult position. 
he's going to have to wiggle his way out of this. Let's see what he has to say. So first, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, it's an exegesis of Revelation 20 and 21. There's that word again, exegesis. Exegesis. I don't even know what it means. Honestly, these words are critical explanation or interpretation of a text. Why not use plain language, man? Really? I want to regroup. So first, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, it's an exegesis of Revelation 20 and 21. It's a... What? It's a critical explanation of Revelation? No, I... I that's not true at all. And why would you even make that claim unless you're trying to spark confusion? That doesn't make any sense. Now, before we proceed to the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21, I want to regroup. So first, so first, Second Peter chapter three is a critical explanation of the book of Revelation. Not bold, baloney. I'm not buying it. There's nothing at all that's to support that. Nothing whatsoever. First, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, it's an exegesis of Revelation 20 and 21. A critical explanation of it? I, that doesn't make sense, man. Okay. So, what's written in Revelation 20 and, and Revelation 21, this is supported all throughout the scripture. Now, you can go back to the Old Testament. You can go back to Genesis 3, verse 15. All right, I would not call, uh, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I wouldn't call that an exegesis of Revelation 20, or Revelation 21 either. But whatever, whatever. It even follows the same sequence. Thousand years, destruction of the heavens and the earth. No, in Second Peter 3, doesn't even talk about, well, there'll be a thousand years. There's nothing at all in Second Peter 3. Right now, he's, he's playing on people that don't read their Bible. Okay, Because if you had read your Bible, you would know. This has absolutely no idea. Or, I'm sorry, this has absolutely no... Um, nothing at all to do with uh, the sequence of events whatsoever nothing at all but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of gotten ungodly men but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day the Lord is not slack concerning his promise this is in the context this is about God not being slack in his promise to return and to um, bring vengeance upon them uh, who are against us okay right, I'm this <laughs> this is not okay well the heavens and all I mean, come on, man. New heavens and the earth. Okay. Secondly, Peter teaches his disciples that the first century church was in the midst of the thousand years. Right, so, no. Peter doesn't make any mention at all of this thousand year period. I mean, have you never read Second Peter 3? Or did you just pick out one verse and uh, try to apply that to a Hollywood movie that you watched and now it's part of your doctrine? You're playing on people that never read the Bible. And it works for them. You can fool them. But you're not fooling me. Thirdly, he warns that the day of the Lord is near and that the thousand years is not a literal thousand years, but that for the Lord it's a day. So he's saying, don't get lax, don't give up hope. The Lord is coming to them and they need to be prepared. Okay? Next, Peter compares the impending destruction of their heavens and earth to the flood 
as does Daniel 9, by the way, right? He said, Daniel chapter 9 says, the end will come like the flood. Meaning... Oh, I see. So he's one of these guys. I, maybe I should maybe I should let him say it in his own words. That's a red flag. All right, and I'm just curious if this guy's going to admit that he believes the Messiah of Daniel Nine is the Antichrist. All right, because think about it, man. If you think the Savior is the Antichrist, if you think the Antichrist is the one that puts away sin. Hey, there's something wrong here. It's not the end of a creation as a whole, but the end of an era. But let's better understand this. As Peter gives us... Alright, so... That made no sense deeper insight into this when he says the elements will be destroyed by fire. He includes that when he says the heavens and the earth will be destroyed. He also says... Alright, so he's wiggling. Alright, he's wiggling and he's wiggling. I'm looking for how he explains how that event already happened. Where the whole world was destroyed by fire and now we live in a world of everlasting life where there is no more pain and no more death. And nobody's dying. Right? And apparently my mom didn't die. Right? That's a wonderful thought. But this is not the world that I put my hope in says the elements will be destroyed by fire. Now we might be tempted to superimpose our free-floating understanding of the elements onto this message, right? But this isn't about the periodic table of elements. That was a 19th century. Okay, so he's jumping all over the place. Free-floating, the uh, periodical table of elements. He's wiggling big time. Convention. If you search scripture for an understanding of how the elements is used, you're going to find the following. You're going to see Colossians chapter 2. You're going to see Hebrews chapter 5. You're going to see Galatians chapter 4. The elements are always referring to the elementary teaching. Alright. Um, so, I think he oops. I think he needs to go back to elementary school. Maybe I need to too, because I can't spell element. Alright, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But now, after that we have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, wherein to ye desire again to be in bondage. And, of course, um, we read here in uh, 2 Peter 3, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, Mr. McMahon's going to say, "No, that's not. That's not literal. That's um, the elementary school teachings is going to melt." Uh, and so, the elementary school teachings would be stuff like what I teach, and that he. Sean McMahon is the expert, the scholarly expert of experts. He is greater than God and we have to trust what Sean McMahon says because we can no longer trust what God says. God burned up his own stuff. Of the law of Moses, or, or in other words the basics, or the foundation, the, the foundation in other words of Jewish society, okay? Is, is any of the is this coherent you're going to see Colossians chapter 2 you're going to see Hebrews chapter 5 you're going to see Galatians chapter 4 the elements are always referring to the elementary teaching
But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, in order for McMahon to be right, all that that I just read to you has to be wrong. You're going to see Colossians chapter 2, you're going to see Hebrews chapter 5, you're going to see Galatians chapter 4. The elements are always referring to the elementary teaching. I mean, how many times can you lie in a 10 minute video? It's incredible. And that's a blatant lie. It's a deliberate act of deception. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. So that's, I mean, come on. Of the law of Moses, or, or in other words, the basics, or the foundation, the, the foundation, in other words, of Jewish society, okay? The constitution of Jewish society, we might say. These were the elements, the elementary principles, the foundation. Uh, so... Without saying it, he says the law of Moses will be burned up, right? Um, oh, what is that verse here? That, uh, oh, no, I that were destroyed by fire and they were in AD 70 and I want to read it there it goes AD 70 I'm telling you that day has nothing to do with by the Bible at all whatsoever there's nothing you can say that happened in 70 AD that fulfills scripture and what he's saying is that Jesus did not rebuild the temple and the temple was not destroyed when he laid down his life and then he'll even point to Daniel 9 and say that the Messiah is the Antichrist. And this is a whole different religion that this guy's preaching. All right, he's preaching an Antichrist religion. It's incredible. All right, so I mean the Bible's very clear, and it's like you've got to deliberately tell this lie, and and. It, purposely ignore the Bible there's no way at all you can believe this stuff and also read the Bible that's not I don't see how it's possible seriously now you either believe Jesus or you're gonna believe Sean McMahon in the preterist viewpoint that the resurrection has already happened and that the destruction of the temple happened in 70 AD and it didn't not happen it did not happen when Jesus laid down his life and then came back to life on the third day All right, that's not the rebuilding of the temple or that's not the destruction of the temple that's not the rebuilding of the temple what Jesus did was just sort of irrelevant right what really matters is what happened in 70 AD, which is not found anywhere in the Bible at all, no, no significance whatsoever, unless you take these fairy tales, these fables of 70 AD, and then replace them with what Jesus actually did. And that's what you're doing. Right? Jesus laid down his life. 
and that that temple was destroyed and then he he was dead he defeated death rose back to life and rebuilds the temple and promises to return for us so that we can have this rebuilt temple ourselves it's pretty simple but what people like Sean McMahon want to say is that in 70 AD the temple was destroyed that, you know just be honest and say well, no Jesus didn't destroy the temple because when you go there you have to say Jesus didn't rebuild the temple on the third day in fact there's no hope for anything and just be honest about it man just be honest and, and say what you really believe in your heart and that is that Jesus Christ is a fraud and that you are God Almighty you can't trust the Bible we have to listen to Sean McMahon says just be honest man if that's what you believe just be honest with yourself more than anything you believe that you're God Almighty and that Jesus Christ is a nobody. Just be honest, man. You're going to offend somebody no matter what you say, but at the end of the day, you can just be honest with what you believe. Be honest to yourself with what you believe. Okay? Reiterate, I'm not saying 1870, I'm saying A.D. August Domino. 70 okay so we'll get to more of this later uh, in the interest of time I gotta keep it brief but he never even touched on how all this has already happened you know how how in the world is it that we are now in our glorified bodies how in the world is that we are in a new heaven with a new earth how in the world is it that there's no more pain no more sorrow no more death you didn't touch on any of it at all. You mumbled and you stumbled your words for nine and a half minutes. We've got a second part. It might even take three parts. We'll see. But thanks for listening. And uh, if you have any more questions about this, you that never I even answered the, the first one, one, Jack. Let me know. Just make sure you subscribe, turn on notifications so you can follow this thread as we're unraveling it and looking into things. God bless you all. Peace. My goodness, man! I just we just wasted all of our time there. You know, expecting an answer and not getting one isn't that something? Well, you mumble and stumble and confuse long enough, people will forget what the question was to begin with. All right. So, uh, what I want to do here, if you're still listening, for anybody that still wonders, uh, I go over this every single day. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand. All right, this is another vision being given to John to show us things which must shortly come to pass. All right, that's clearly stated in Revelation 1. And the angel is the one that is showing John these things which must shortly come to pass and he laid hold of the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fit, fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season so let me uh, make this real simple okay before Jesus came along before baby Jesus came along there was one country one nation of people one nation of God I should say one nation of God outside of that nation of God were nations deceived by Satan now here comes Jesus and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him and now that barrier is taken away so there is no longer one country with borders that is the nation of God now the nation of God is available in all 
countries all throughout the world. So now Satan cannot, he has no group of people to deceive. There's no uh, country that he can, he's got sole possession of. Okay? So now he's bound for this period of time. He's bound right now. Because there are believers in every country all throughout the world. He doesn't have full control over the nations outside of the nation of God like he once had. Alright, keep that in mind. We'll get we'll explain that more here in a second. And I saw thrones. Alright. And they sat upon them. Alright, who is who is this that he's talking about? He's talking about us believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We sit on thrones. Alright, first Revelation or Revelation one. First Revelation chapter one. Okay. So verse six it says and has made us kings and priests. And God, right now we are kings. Right now we are a royal priesthood. Alright. Right now we are royalty. Right now. Right now we are royalty. Alright, we are kings and priests unto God. Right now we sit on thrones. Right now. And judgment is, has already been given to us. That are born of the Spirit of God. Judgment has already been given to us. We're kings and priests and unto God. We are a royal priesthood right now. And we can never die. Judgment has already been given to us. We have eternal life. Nothing can ever take that away. That will never change. We are saved, sealed, secured, sanctified forever. Nothing will ever change that. Judgment has already been given to us that are born of the Spirit of God. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of the for a witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Alright, so there's an obvious difference between unsaved people and saved people living during this period of time. All right, and the saved people um, will and have been getting beheaded for being a witness of Jesus. And the unsaved people are worshiping the beast by default because they do not worship God. They do not trust God and they are unsaved devils. And um, we live among them, of course, and neither. All right, so right now we live and reign with Christ right now so how can you rightly say that you are saved if Jesus Christ is not reigning in your life it doesn't make any sense does it of course when you're born of the Spirit of God Jesus abides in you and you abide in him and we know by reading the book of Luke in the very first chapter that Jesus Christ reigns over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there is no end so he reigns forever and when we are born of the Spirit of God he reigns with us we reign with him we are one in Christ okay but the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Who is the first resurrection? Jesus is the first resurrection. Can we go back here? Is this the one that I want? Alright. 1 Corinthians 15. Alright. Remember this is the one that I just pointed to about uh, death is swallowed up in victory. Alright, the last trump. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed into our glorified bodies. Okay, remember that. All right, so we'll go up here. Um, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So clearly nobody has 
been resurrected until he comes in the clouds of heaven and obviously there's only going to be one resurrection at that point in time all right and it's going to be all of us that are saved and all the unsaved are going to be destroyed forever but otherwise it wouldn't if if it was not that if that wasn't the case then it wouldn't be the end but clearly it is the end of this world just like the world in the days of noah before the flood that world is completely over with that'll never happen again the world that we're living in right now this will this is temporary all right once it's over it's over forever it will happen again all right so jesus is the first fruits of them that slept now if you read your bible you would have known that jesus says i am the resurrection and the life let me see what he says here if i can figure it out find it out and ooh, john chapter 11 jesus said said unto her i am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live jesus is the resurrection he is the first resurrection he is the first fruits of them that slept wait is there another verse here that i can look up yeah let's let's just go make sure first fruit slap was that the did i just miss it i did didn't i oh i did i missed it where's this at oh yeah okay right there that's what i was looking for christ the first fruits after were they that are christ that is coming and right here it is all right if in this life only we have hope in christ we are all men most miserable okay now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept he is the first resurrection you got to be out of your cotton picking mind to say that jesus is not the first resurrection Jesus is the first resurrection, and we are partakers of his resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. We are not the first resurrection. We have part in the first resurrection, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I, you know, I wonder, you know, is this written this way on purpose? Maybe. So that people that lack faith won't understand it? That's very possible. I mean, this is very simple to see when your eyes are open, but if your eyes are closed, I don't think you can see it. Really. On such, the second death has no power. Remember what I just read for you over here? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And there's another verse here we can go to. Alright, um, it's in I thought it was in John 11 also. Yeah. Wait a second. Where are we at here? Let me go back here. <laughs> yeah. The very next verse. I'm sorry about that. See? I need to read my Bible a little more, it looks like. Okay. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The second death has no power over those of us that are born of the Spirit of God. And I showed you already, we are a royal priesthood. They shall be priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years so let's go look at two places here in Exodus 19 all right it says here um, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel we are a kingdom of priests all right we are a royal priesthood we are called to preach the gospel to every creature all right we are priest of god and of christ right now and shall reign with him a thousand years. how can you say that you're saved but yet you're not a priest of god and of christ and jesus doesn't reign in your life right now 
Well, then you're not saved. By your own words, you're not saved. Now, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Remember what I was explaining up here in the first three verses about how there was one country uh, that was a nation of God outside of that nation of God were nations deceived by Satan. And then Jesus comes along and makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. Now Satan is bound because he doesn't have full control over all the nations outside of the one nation of God because all the nations, because the people of God are scattered all throughout the world. Alright, so he doesn't have the power like he had before. But when the thousand years are expired, this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are lifted up in the air. First the dead in Christ, and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Alright, so when we're up in the air, guess what? The only people on earth are unsaved people. And so now, Satan has the ability to once again deceive the nations like he had done before Jesus came along. Alright, so we're up in the air. And all the unsaved people are at our feet. Alright, that's the scenario that's being painted here and all throughout the Bible. At the end of the world. Alright, and when Satan is loosed, he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38. If you want to... Um, some... Clear, uh, some uh, if you want to strengthen your knowledge, I guess. Give you a little more confidence on what this is talking about. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Alright, so Satan goes out to deceive the nations, that he gathers them at our feet. Remember what we read in Revelation 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. And Psalm 110, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So all throughout the Bible it talks about... Um, the, our enemy is going to be at our feet and then they are going to be destroyed forever and just like what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 wherever that was no right here we go alright so he told you has put in all his enemies under his feet and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory Alright, so, and they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, so they're going to be at our feet, they're going to be compassed us about while we're up in the air. They're going to be gathered at our feet. The beloved city, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is above, and the mother of us all, right? Let's see if we can get this here. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. all right, so obviously, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up, and our enemies gathered at our feet, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. All right, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus is going to stomp on the head of the serpent. This is the this is it. This is the moment. It's the same thing. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. This is consistent all throughout the Bible. All right, and the devil that deceived him cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. Uh, this is letting you know this is the same thing, the same moment, the same place that you just read about in the other vision, which was in John 19. All right, it's not a thousand years afterwards that you know some people teach. I'm this stupid. It is a lack of understanding, a lack of discernment, and a lack of faith in the Word of God because all this is is the same thing this is the end of the world man there's not 35 different ends of the world 
all you have to do is connect the dots and see that when it's the end of the world it's described many times in many different ways to help us give us a better understanding of what it's like and what it's going to be like and it, and it is an important event because we are putting our hope our faith our trust and our thoughts and everything in a world to come that is much greater than the world that we're living in all right because this world is full of pain and agony and suffering we don't we want eternal life but not in this world and we're promised this world's coming to an end and we're being given descriptions of the end of the world all throughout the bible okay all right and so we see judgment um whosoever was not found and written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire so we seeing the end of all wickedness forever and ever and ever and okay and of course i gotta point out once again that verse 11 is when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven just like what we read in matthew 24 mark 13 luke 21 all throughout the bible when jesus comes behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him all right this is the moment that's it when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and the the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken this is it that's the moment All right, there's the connection if there was any confusion any doubt that's the connection the great white throne of him that sat on it you know there shouldn't be any doubt about it anyways obvious when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven every eye shall see him it's going to be the end of the world and behold He's going to make all things new. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Alright, and to our friend Sean McMahon, that has not happened yet. It's not even close. My advice for you is to God bless you all. Peace. Put your faith in the Word of God. All right. Trust the Bible that you hold in your hands that it is from God, because it is. Stop trusting what man says. All right. You know, that's what you're doing. I already know. You're saying, well, the Hebrew word for this and the Greek word for that and the Chinese verb for this and the Mexican. Um, blah 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 you're believing everything and anything outside of what it actually says you can't believe the ESV or the NIV whatever it is that you're reading you yourself know that that book is corrupt it's got contradictions and omissions and it cannot be the Word of God and so you're pointing now back to languages and not to Bibles and now you're taking the translations of those languages which come from man so you're putting all your trust in man and not in the Word of God okay to give you a, a contrasting view I have a Bible that I hold in my hands and I believe these are the words of God nothing can change that nothing at all and there's no contradiction no error no omission whatsoever I don't have to rely on I don't have to learn foreign languages to know what God says I mean that's what Muslims do Muslims say you gotta learn the original Arabic to know what Allah says that's what they say anytime there's a verse that uh, they don't like to explain they'll revert back to well you gotta read it in Arabic you can't trust the English translation and you're doing the same thing Sean you're saying well you can't trust the English translation you gotta go back to the original languages which are dead by the way and I could get into that and I've gotten into it several 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 times whether there be tongues they shall cease all right with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and for all that will they not hear me 
saith the Lord. Well, I'm telling you, start listening to the Lord. Start trusting the Word of God that you hold in your hands. You believe in a perfect Word of God in heaven, then you ought to believe in a perfect Word of God on earth. And I'll leave you with one last thought here. Let's see, where's the... i got to think about what I'm trying to look for here. Okay, that's... Oh, okay, I got it. I got it, okay. Not a bone... Oh, I got it. Not a bone on him. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Uh, so, the Word of God cannot be broken. If, it, if you have a, a book and it's broken, then it's not the Word of God. You know, remember, Jesus is the Word of God. Alright. Now let's go. John 19, verse 36. For these things which... The, for these things were done, that the Scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Right, John 19, verse 36. Right, And the Scripture cannot be broken. Think about that. The Word of God is the Scripture. Just as the bone on Jesus was not broken, neither can a word, the Word of God, be broken. So when you read the NIV and the ESV, these are not the words of God because they're broken. All right? Think about it. I mean, you believe that Jesus can, well, maybe Sean doesn't, but I'll say this to anybody else. You believe Jesus can resurrect you from the dead, but he can't give you a perfect Bible in your own language? Well, what kind of God is that? No, 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 I'm telling you, the key is faith. The key to understanding the Word of God is faith. It's always been about faith. It's always been about faith. Oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing here. It's always been about faith, man. It always been about faith. If you don't believe, if you don't have faith in the Bible that you hold in your hands, you don't have faith at all.